Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you had a great lunch. Uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Marvin. I work at Google. I also do uh, some open source work on Detect, uh, which is one thing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and yeah, in general, I'm going to talk about static analysis uh, for Kotlin code, um, just why you should use it, uh, which tools are out there, giving you an overview of what's there, um, and looking a bit into the internals of how they work and how you can possibly extend them. So static analysis in general. Static analysis tools are tools that take a look at your code, at your source code, and tr they try to point out issues to you that might be in that code. Um, they, these issues might range from formatting issues up to potential bugs, security issues, and so on. Uh, so there's a wide range of tools um, that cater for different needs as well. And Back when I was working at SoundCloud, for example, when we were transitioning towards Kotlin, one question that always came up in the team is like, how can we ensure that the Kotlin code we write while we're still learning the new language, how can we ensure that this code is up to standards and that we're not making some, some bugs, uh, writing some bugs potentially? Uh, one answer for us was static analysis in this, in this case, um, adding some static analysis suites that would point out these issues to us. Um, and that has been really helpful um, because when you come from the Java world, there's already a huge range of tools available, tools such as CheckStyle, PMD, FindBugs, error-prone, much, much, much more. Um, and they all analyze your code for code smells in the Java world. But uh, when we came to the Kotlin world, some of these tools were missing for us, and so we were looking, and this is basically, yeah, I'm going to describe um, the tools that are out there that you can use. So basically, in short, uh, static analysis tools are tools that can tell you that this code might need some work. Um, there's issues with formatting, optional keywords. There's a null pointer uh, potentially in there as well. Um, so static analysis tools should go crazy and tell you, please change stuff here. Um, but it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't go just into formatting. It goes into potential bugs and security issues, performance issues, much, much more as well. As so you can really leverage these tools for those cases. Now, you might say, uh, and also in the keynote this morning, you heard Kotlin is a very safe language, and it's also being advertised as such. Um, for example, on the Android developer guidelines, uh, that Kotlin is a very safe language. Uh, and that is true. Even some research um, might agree with that. So there has been a paper by Mateo and Martinez uh, where they analyzed open source Android applications that were written in Java initially. And once they migrated to Kotlin code, they found that 50% of those apps actually increased their code quality. So they ran a set of static analysis suites on those applications' code and found out that the quality has increased. Um, so now you might ask me, why do we need static analysis in the first place if the code is already so much safer than, uh, for example, the Java code we might be writing? Um, well, if you think back to the code on, on one of the earlier slides, um, we're human beings, we make mistakes. Even if we do code reviews, we might be missing some nuances or we don't understand the full context of that one line change, like which classes is this being used from, what kind of side effects could this have, and static analysis tools can help us um, look into this context much deeper and take some analysis. So it can help us in a code review um, basically do like a first pass and uh, tell us, here's some of the issues that are out there in, in, in the code that we might have been writing. Um, it, does not, um, it does not make code reviews obsolete, of course, uh, but it can help. And it can help encode uh, your best practices that you have for your code. Um, and it can help uh, you um, not run into some issues in production in the end. Um, it also can help you, for example, help onboard new, peop uh, new people to your team. Like if you, you don't have to say all the time, like, oh, we don't do that. Here we do it some, some other way. You could have some custom rules. Um, that you might implement in these tools that can actually point this out in PR directly. And then you have some robot saying, oh, please use some other class instead. So let's take a look at uh, an overview of the tools that you could use that help you make your Kotlin code safer. Uh, first up, we have the Kotlin compiler. That's uh, something you probably all use, hopefully. Um, and good thing about the compiler is you invoke it all the time. So you compile your code, and the compiler is going to either break um, because you have a compilation issue in your code, or um, it is also going to spit out some warnings if you look at the command line when you invoke the compiler. There might be some warnings in there. They're not necessarily super bad, 
but those could be some, some points to look into in your code base. So for example, it might point out to you that you're using deprecated um, classes or methods. It might point out to you that you're shadowing some properties in your lambdas. Um, and those can be helpful to look into to make your code safer and easier to understand as well. Um, if, you, if you so choose, you can also change the uh, Kotlin compiler um, with, a compile term, uh, with a compiler flag to treat all warnings that it spits out as, as errors, and so that your code breaks even earlier um, if you choose so. Um, next up, we have IntelliJ, um, also a tool that we probably all use during development, which makes it, again, really handy because we get that feedback immediately. So you write the code, and IntelliJ is going to give you that squiggly line and tell you there's an issue here. Um, and that is really handy and fast feedback. Um, and if you look at the settings from IntelliJ, you can actually find a lot more um, inspections actually in there that might, not be able, uh, that might not be enabled by default. So if you take a look in there and find some inspections that you might actually find useful, you can enable them. Uh, on the contrary, if there's uh, some issue that IntelliJ is reporting to in your code over and over and over again that you might not particularly care about, you can also disable it. Um, so yeah, it's really handy because IntelliJ gives you these hints right during development. You don't have to invoke anything else. Um, you have this immediate feedback. Um, of course, in IntelliJ, many of these inspections and the issues that it points out to you can also just automatically fix with an alt enter, and it's just fixed, uh, which makes it really, really handy and really, really fast to act on them. Um, and in addition, you can, if you so choose, also run um, the IntelliJ inspections from your command line. Um, if you set up an inspection profile um, through the settings, you can invoke this from the command line if you have a full installation of IntelliJ um, downloaded. Uh, so that's really handy. Next, we have bytecode analyzers. Um, those are tools that already exist in the Java world. Bytecode analyzers, as the name implies, they work on bytecode. So they look at the JVM bytecode and try to figure out certain patterns and, rep patterns and report issues um, that they might find. Um, the good thing about bytecode is Kotlin also compiles down to bytecode. So if you have a tool like FindBugs, which is a bytecode analyzer, uh, you can just use this on your Kotlin code as well, because it compiles down to the same bytecode. Um, so you can uh, have the same inspections running um, on both Java and Kotlin code. Um, however, because it requires bytecode um, to run, um, you probably need to compile your code. Uh, this might take a bit of time, depending on your compile times. Uh, so that might be uh, something you probably want to run on CI um, when you compile your code anyways, and, and then you can run this in addition. Um, other analyzers uh, might be running on source code, um, so they don't necessarily need your code to be compiled. Next, we have Android Lint. Um, Kotlin has taken the Android community by storm, um, as we've heard in the keynote as well. Uh, so many Android projects are using uh, Kotlin. Uh, so having Android Lint in there uh, uh, is almost a necessity. Um, so Android Lint, of course, it is focused on Android development and is focused on checks that check for certain Android uh, development patterns. Um, but it goes a bit further than that as well. So yeah, most checks are Android specific. However, these checks can run both on Java and Kotlin code as well, similar to what the bytecode analyzers were able to do. Android Lint can do as well. So if you have a certain rule that checks for Java to Kotlin interoperability, um, this rule can run um, on your Java and Kotlin code. And that is really, really helpful if you are building rules, uh, if you're building custom rules. Um, this really helps cover all of your code if you're migrating from a Java code base to a Kotlin code base, because you probably will have Java and Kotlin side by side for a while. Uh, Android Lint also has support for non-Android projects. So you don't necessarily have to have an Android library or an Android application um, to use Android Lint. You can also use it from your pure Kotlin uh, project. Of course, in that case, it's not going to run all the Android-specific rules, but there is uh, still a set of rules that you can leverage, and you can also still extend it to use custom rules in your code base. Um, Android Lint can also run um, on other files, such as XML, Gradle build files, uh, and some others as well. So it's really, it can work on a huge range of different um, file types. Uh, if you want to run uh, Android Lint, if you have an Android project, it's probably everything is set up already, so you just run Gradle Lint, and it's going to tell you all the issues that it finds in your code. If you have a, a Kotlin project, you want to import the Android uh, Gradle plugin, 
um, and apply the com android lint plugin. Uh, and then you can also run Gradle Lint. Again, with a smaller set of rules, but still you get uh, a lot of interesting feedback. You can also configure it in more detail. So if you choose that, if Android Lint finds an error in your code, like reports uh, an issue with a severity of error, um, that it breaks your build so that you can't even commit this um, without fixing the issue. You could also ignore warnings if you so choose. Um, and you can configure it in much more de detail with, this, um, with an XML file where you can set much, much more detailed configuration options, such as enabling and de disabling certain rules, enabling certain rules only for certain paths, or changing the severity of it. Maybe in your project, you care about one rule really, really deeply, so you want to set the severity of that as high as you can, for example, or other rules you don't care as much about, but you still want to know about the issues that it reports, so you might set the, vis uh, the severity a bit lower. Two more tools, um, KTLint and Detect. These are static analysis suites that are uh, purely focusing on Kotlin code. They, they focus on Kotlin specifics, and they also only run on Kotlin files. They're purely written in Kotlin. They're open source. You can find them on GitHub. Um, and yeah, they try to make your Kotlin code nicer, more coherent, and, and safer. If you look at KTLint, um, it takes an approach that you don't need to configure it. You can configure it if you want to. Um, but as it is mostly focused on code style and formatting, um, it adheres to the standard guidelines that are out there. So like the official JetBrains um, code style is enabled by default. So it's going to report issues where you um, diverge from the official code style guides. Um, it also has support for the Android uh, Kotlin style guide, um, which you can enable in KTLint. And it's just going to report all the issues that it finds uh, in your code which diverge from that style guide. So it's super handy for like just dropping it in, into your code, uh, running it, and, and getting notified of all these issues. Um, KTLint also has a built-in formatter. Um, and this um, can fix a lot of the uh, issues that it reports. Not all of them, but it can, uh, can uh, fix quite a few of them. Um, so you could, for example, run the formatter on a, on a pre-commit hook um, to automatically format your code to be more coherent. Um, there's also third-party Gradle plugins if you want um, to integrate them. So it's really easy. If you want to run it from the command line, you just invoke ktlint. You give it an optional uh, input parameter if you only want to run it on certain paths. Um, and if you pass dash dash format, it's going to auto format um, everything that it can. Moving over to Detect, Detect takes a slightly different approach. Um, it chooses an approach where you can configure rules in as much detail as you want to. Um, the rules are also not focused on formatting. Um, we even at some point decided to drop support for all formatting rules that we implemented because KT Lind is doing a really good job at that. Um, so we left that out uh, and focus on many other different uh, potential issues instead such as uh, how you handle exceptions, how you write documentation, uh, performance issues that might be hiding in your code, um, potential bugs, complexity, and so on. Um, and again, you can configure these rules pretty much in detail. So if there's like an edge case where your uh, project might diverge from the standard assumptions, um, or you have an Android project where some, things, uh, some, some parts of the code might be a bit different, um, you can m configure most of the rules to be more tailored toward your project, and so that the tech works with you and not against you. It also, as I mentioned, like detect dropped support for formatting. Um, all the rules were removed, but we optionally wrap KTLint um, so that you can um, use KTLint as well uh, from detect if you so choose. Um, detect also has a plugin for IntelliJ so that you can get also immediate feedback in the IDE. Uh, we have a Gradle plugin. Um, and also support for sonar. Uh, if you want to run detect, uh, you can run the detect jar with an input. Um, you probably want to pass a configuration so that you configure detect uh, to, to match the expectations in your, uh, in your code base. And if you want to use the Gradle plugin, uh, you can do so and configure it with the detect configuration. One more note on, on Gradle plugins, uh, especially uh, since there's so many different static analysis tools, some special to Java, some special to Kotlin, some that work on both. But a lot of them have different APIs and how you set them up. 
Uh, and there's a bunch of third-party Gradle plugins that actually try to wrap as many as possible and give them a very similar API so that you can simply um, configure them uh, in a uniform way. Uh, so that can be really helpful if you try to set up multiple uh, static analysis suites. They can really help you. So if you've set up everything and you run Gradle check and wait a bit for all the suites to finish, and especially if you've just integrated new static analysis suites or you just started with static analysis suites, you might see something like this, that you suddenly have 8,000 issues. Uh, congratulations. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean your code is uh, horrible. Um, it might be mean that the tools are not really configured to work with you yet, uh, something to look into. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can use these results. Because just knowing, cool, I have 8,000 issues, doesn't really help you much. And you also don't want to see a, a list of 8,000 issues in your command line. Um, so you want to use these uh, results uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, so all these tools uh, generally generate reports. Um, you might have to enable them for some, some tools. And gener generally, they um, generate a report in XML format. XML is really nice because you can parse it easily um, and can use them um, further. So for example, this is uh, how a report from Android Lint might look like. Um, basically pointing out one issue uh, in your code. Uh, and it has a lot of different things, but it basically tells you what is being reported, why is it being reported, which category of issue does it uh, belong to. It tells you the severity of the issue, and it also tells you where exactly in your code is this issue located, which is really helpful, because otherwise you wouldn't know. Like In my huge code base, there's this one issue, but I don't know where. So it's really important to know where the issue actually is. And because it comes in XML, uh, you can parse them, you can count how many issues you have, and you can use them further. Um, for that, it's really important that you run static analysis. If you have an entire suite, run all of them on every build that you run on CI. Uh, so you can keep track of the issues that you have, uh, and you can also fix issues that you go, as you go. So you don't just run static analysis every couple of weeks and then figure out, hmm, my number went up or it went down, nice. Um, but you probably want some continuous feedback on how you're doing. And also, that allows you to look into new issues uh, immediately. So yeah, keep track of how many issues you have. And if this goes down, that's nice. If there is like a spike in issues suddenly, um, that might have a reason. Like maybe you enabled some new rules. Maybe you um, integrated a new static analysis suite altogether. Um, but yeah, keep track of the overall count of issues and try to tackle them slowly. Don't just be like. Um, scared about these 8,000 issues that are suddenly there. Um, take, the, take it slow and, and slowly chip away at these issues. There's also other things you can do with these reports. For example, GitHub uh, earlier this year announced uh, the Checks API so that in your PR you can actually have a separate tab which, points, uh, which you can put static analysis results into it. It's been built for exactly this. Um, so you could show your uh, Parsi XML reports and put them there. There's also other tools out there that, for example, um, read the XML reports that you have and post them as comments on your GitHub PR so that you have like a first pass code review, kind of, from a static analysis suite that tells you right there in line on your PR, like, hey, this line has an issue. Uh, please take a look at this. Um, and this can be super helpful um, as really like as a first pass code review. Um, it doesn't replace an actual human, another developer taking a look at your code as well. Um, but it can be really helpful in, in, in not introducing too many new issues. There's also specialized tools such as Sonar, uh, which give you a great overview of your overall code, code health. So that's also something you can look into. Generally, every single issue that a static analysis tool is going to report has a certain severity attached to it. Uh, the typical ones are warning and error. Um, but there's also many, many other uh, levels of severity, such as informational or fatal, depending on what the issue actually describes. Um, generally, you probably want to focus on the, the bad ones first. Uh, an error might point out something like you have a security issue in your code, or there's like a performance issue that you could improve on. Um, a warning might be something like you didn't format something quite right. Still something you can look into, you should look into and like, keep your code cohesive. Um, but probably you want to look at the security issue first. Um, as I've mentioned before, for example, in Android Lint, you can break your build upon a certain severity. 
uh, so that you can't even commit your code um, and merge that pull request in case you have any of these issues in your code. Uh, and also in Android Lint, uh, in the configuration, you can assign every rule. You can override the severity. So as I've mentioned, if a certain issue is very, very important to you and your code base, you can make that really explicit and make that a fatal, uh, fatal error, for example. So if you have 8,000 issues and you don't really want to look at them and there's just like such a huge number that it doesn't make sense looking into this anyways because you'll never get through that list other than sitting a developer in a room for a month uh, walking through all these issues, uh, what you can do is you can work with a baseline. Uh, a baseline is basically you run the tool once, you run one static analysis tool once, um, it will output uh, a baseline file, which is basically just a list of all the issues that it's found. In the second run of the tool, you'll pass it this baseline file, which the tool will then go through and ignore every single issue that has been already reported in that baseline. So even though you might have 8,000 issues in your code reported by your static analysis tools, it'll ignore all of them for now and only report the new ones. That's really helpful for really getting that incremental, like making sure that you're not, you're not incrementally adding new issues to your code. And then you can take a look at the baseline every once in a while and chip away at those issues that are in there uh, to try to get it to zero. So yeah, baselines are supported, for example, by the tech, by Android Lint, um, and can be really helpful, especially when you set up a static analysis suite um, from scratch. And yeah, as I mentioned, make these tools work with you. Adapt them to your best practices in your code base, um, especially when it comes to rules such as naming conventions or other, uh, other issues that might be very, very dependent on your code base. Um, many tools allow you to configure them in more detail, um, and so you can adapt them to, to work for you. So you can enable certain rules that, you, that might be disabled by default, but you, they might be really helpful for your code base in your particular cases. Um, also, some rules that are enabled by default, maybe they don't make sense for you. Maybe you just keep ignoring that issue over and over and over again. So you, then just disable it. If you're not going to look into it, disable the rule altogether. It doesn't make sense adding those 100 uh, reported issues to your, to your reports all the time. Yeah, if the tools allow it, you can configure these rules in more detail to make them work um, better for you so that they ignore possibly certain cases that they don't check as thoroughly or check more thoroughly. Um, you can go into the config and read, uh, read up on every rule what kind of configurations they support. And yeah, again, use a baseline to tackle this huge mass of issues that you might, uh, might have when you start introducing static analysis to your tools, uh, to, your, to your build, uh, to not work with this huge amount of issues uh, all the time, but you can only focus on the incremental ones. If there has been an issue reported by a static analysis tool that you think, uh, this might be an exception, I want to ignore this, you can suppress um, this rule from being reported. Uh, Kotlin has a default suppress annotation, which you can use. Uh, most tools will, uh, will um, listen to this annotation. Um, for example, Android Lint has its own annotation with add suppress lint, and you give it the name of the rule that you want to suppress. Um, and overall, every single tool will allow you to suppress uh, certain instances of uh, issues being reported. Um, so that uh, can be really helpful in cases where you really want to make an exception. And if you want to make an exception, you probably should say why you're making this exception. So put a comment on there and explain why you're not doing this. Maybe because you want to tackle this later. Maybe it's a really, really um, hard problem to solve at the moment without doing a bigger refactoring. So maybe put a ticket number in there and say, like, we'll do this later. Um, and if you think this issue has been reported, but it shouldn't have been reported, so it's a bug, then also please report this instance, like post your code and the issue that's being reported and let the developers of the certain tool know so that they can look into it and fix the bug. OK. Let's look at how these tools work internally. What do they do when you invoke them? What happens? And how, like, how can you leverage this? So I'm using Android Lint as an example um, because it's really powerful. Um, however, for example, KT Lint and Detect, they work in a similar manner. And I'll point out some of the, the, the differences that are um, in these tools. So it all starts with you invoke the tool. You pass a bunch of Kotlin files to this tool. The tool's then going to start up. It's going to look for your configuration options, like how you configure it. It's going to start up, read the baseline, read the config, and everything. 
The tool is then going to transform your code into AST. AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree, and it's like a representation in the tree structure of your code. And it represents um, yeah, the structure of your code, how it looks like, and certain, put certain pr properties on it. Uh, in the case of Android Lint, it is going to use the UAST, which is a universal AST. Uh, that's uh, created by JetBrains. And the universal in there stands for you can use this for multiple languages. It's not particular to one certain language, but um, at the moment, it, it fits both for uh, Java, and, and, uh, Java and Kotlin. So you can have the same rule work on both types of files, on both um, Java and Kotlin, and report the same issues, which is really helpful. Uh, the Tech and KT Lint, on the other hand, they are specific to Kotlin, so they use the Kotlin AST, uh, which does not work for Java files. Um, and so they only work on, on, on Kotlin sources. So how does this AST look like? Let's take a look at this very simple class uh, and look at how the AST, uh, what the AST looks like. So this entire thing is a file, a U file. Uh, this U prefix is, uh, the, is present in all types of the U AST. Um, for example, the Kotlin AST has the KT prefix, prefix so there would be a KT file. Um, so this U file contains a U class, which is also it's in the entire thing. And the class has a name, kotlinconf. It then contains a U field of, of name year, which has an annotation and an expression that assigns the value uh, 2018. The annotation on there is, in this case, the non-null annotation, because it's not uh, nullable. Then next, we have a U method uh, with a parameter of with the name year. So you can see like every single part of your code matches a node in the AST, and every node in the AST has more parameters on your code. And a static analysis tool will then go in and, and look at the AST, look at every node, and comp like, compare the structure of the AST to make some certain assertions and report issues if you diverge from the expectation. And then the actual uh, function body is a, a block expression with a call expression that is basically the print line statement. So, yeah, so you pass the files to your tool. It's going to transform it to this uh, tree representation of the code. And then it's going to look at uh, certain assumptions. So lint first takes a look at uh, a list of issue registries, which is basically a provider for a list of issues that lint supports. Uh, and basically, the issue registry just stores a, a list of issue. And an issue is pretty similar to what we saw in the XML report before. Um, an issue basically is a data class describing what this rule checks for, explains why it might be reported, uh, which severity it has, which cat category um, it belongs to. Um, and it also has a link to the in implementation, which links to the actual class doing the analysis uh, on, your, uh, on your code. And yeah, if you compare them side by side, um, they match pretty much, much exactly. Um, for example, the, the location of the issue being reported in the report, that does, is not stored in the issue, of course. Uh, that is then provided um, by the detector class that actually runs the analysis and says, like, yeah, this piece of code has an issue. So the AST gets passed to these detectors. The detectors go look at the AST nodes, make some comparisons, make some assumptions. And if the code does not match these assumptions, um, it will report an issue. So t things rules typically do is look at a node, look at certain properties, and check if those properties are correct. Um, other things they could do is look at parents. So for example, look uh, at the class that a function is in. Um, is it an interface, for example, then, and you have a certain rule that checks for something in that case? Or you could look at children of this node and make certain assertions there. So let's put an example to this. Uh, if we would like to have a rule for this very simple class with just two imports, um, and we say we don't want to use the Android lock class in our code, we want to forbid doing that, and we want to report an issue for that. Um, we can write a rule for that. And because we're looking at an import, you probably don't want to uh, forbid this import to just be used in Kotlin code. You probably also want to have the same rule work on Java code um, 
or you might have a special case where you only want to forbid it in Kotlin code, but that doesn't really make sense. Um, so you probably want to use something that supports both Java and Kotlin at the same time. Android Lint comes in really handy here with the UAST so that it can support both. If we look at the AST for this file, it is very simple. It's simply a U file which contains two U imports, uh, two U import statements in, in particular. And then we can go in and write a rule. And this is a very, very simple rule, and, and, and most rules really are very simple, um, and they're not that hard to write. So this is an example. This is the entire thing that would we'll check for, um, are we importing Android U to Lint, and it will report uh, if you do. So you basically extend a U element handler, and that is um, an interface uh, that provides you with visit methods for every single node type there is. And your rule can, uh, your implementation can override these functions so that you get called when lint walks the AST of your, of your code and then checks, oh, visit this import statement, and then you do your an analysis. So that's exactly what we do in this case. So we visit import statements, and uh, this rule is getting called, and then we can do the analysis on it. So what we, do with an, what we could do with an import statement is we could resolve it. Uh, which means we can actually look into the class that is being imported and do certain checks on it. For example, is it actually a class we're importing? Um, this can go much, much uh, further into detail on, like, you can check what this, uh, what this class is actually uh, doing and if it is the correct class we're looking for. Um, and if it's not a class, then we don't particularly care about it. We can just return. And then we look at the fully qualified name of this uh, class and just match it. Does it match our expectation? Is it called Android Util Log? If it is, then we probably want to report the issue. So this is a really simple rule. And if you have this, it'll work both on Java and Kotlin code. And you get this report. And if you use it and put, for example, a comment on your pull request, you can automatically remind people that maybe we should use that other log class that we've written. Um, there's some slight differences here between what lint can do and what, for example, detect and KT lint can do. Um, with this resolve call, uh, Android lint can really look into this class, um, whereas detect does not support this kind of type resolution. Um, detect only uh, does a lot of string matching uh, and pattern matching, looks at regexes uh, to do certain assertions. So it would really just look at the import statement, check, does it say import Android user log? OK, let's report an issue. Uh, Android Lin can go further than that. Um, and this type resolution really helps with um, making your assertions more correct. Um, some some uh, rules, some assertions really need type resolution so that you can look into this class and make assumptions uh, or like make assertions on it. Um, and that is one thing that is uh, certainly missing from uh, KT Lint and Detect at the moment. Um, there's work going on to add this as well to get these additional benefits. Um, there's one more thing that uh, Android Lint then uh, will do that you can tell Android Lint about. Uh, in your detector class, you can override methods such as getting the applicable UAST types. So you can tell Android Lint which um, types of the, uh, which nodes of the AST you care about. Um, in our case, we really want, we really only care about import statements. Um, that means that uh, Android Lint can. Um, do some optimizations, and if there's a class without uh, import statements, it doesn't even need to call your detector at all. So it can do a lot of optimizations like that. And there are similar other um, getter methods in the detector uh, class as well, which you can override to tell Lint more about the context that you want to be run into. So in the end, all your rules are running. Um, they will report issues, hopefully not too many, uh, but the correct ones. And then it's going to generate reports. As we've mentioned, there's XML reports. There's typically also HTML reports, which are nicer to look at for you. Uh, but if you want to parse them, the XML report typically comes, comes in more handy. And then you can use these reports and do whatever you want with them, probably uh, make them visible somewhere. So let's talk a bit more about extensibility. So this rule I was showing is not a default rule in Android Lint. It's something um, you can write up pretty quickly. And you can extend Android Lint and also the other tools. You can extend KT Lint and Detect with special rules that you might care about in your tools, uh, in your code base. Um, and yeah, further enhance the usefulness that these tools give you uh, in your day-to-day -day development. 
Uh, you can, if you have certain code style, uh, code style regulations in your code base that you care about that these tools don't handle, like not using uh, Android Util Log, for example, if, you, if that's something you do, you can write this rule and really encode that in your, in your static analysis suite so that you get a reminder on pull requests to not use these classes. So yeah, if you write this, if you remember writing uh, comments like this over and over and over again in pull requests, it's probably something you can automate uh, and use static analysis for to, uh, to make it easier for you. Also, if you, for example, run into bugs that you, you see a crash in production and you think once you find the bug fix for it, you think that, could, that should have been something that someone saw in a code review, but we missed it because we didn't have all the context. Maybe you can write a, a static analysis rule for it to next time not even have this issue in production, but have it being reported in a pull request. And if you extend these tools, you don't have to know about how does this AST get constructed. Um, all this business is done by the tool itself. All you have to care about is writing your detector and some code around it to, to make it available to the tool. Um, but you don't, yeah, you don't have to construct the AST yourself. There's extension APIs uh, which you can use. So if you want to build your own custom rule, all you have to do is create, for Android Linux uh, again, you have to create your own custom issue registry listing all the issues that you have written. In this case, we only have one. Um, and in the end, you will compile this into a jar. And in the jar, you have to put into the manifest uh, some way to, for Lint to find your issue registry. So you will link it um, in the manifest, telling Lint, please, take also, uh, please also take a look at this issue registry. Then you would write your custom issue and detector, similar to what we've seen with the Android log rule. Um, and if you need inspiration or help on how you could write these, like how do I use the AST correctly, um, you can always take a, like it's always really helpful to, to look at the rules that already exist. Um, so you can look at uh, the Android Lint rules that are currently uh, available and, and look at the code and then uh, go start from there. You can also look at the, the, the rules from the other tools that are open source um, and start from there and get some inspiration. Next, if you write a rule, please write a test for it. Uh, and all these tools have like test APIs that can help you. Um, but you want to make sure that if you write a static analysis rule, it shouldn't fire like crazy and have errors that are annoying everyone, because at some point people will not care about it anymore. So make sure you test your rule correctly for edge cases and checking that it reports in the correct instances and doesn't report in other instances where it shouldn't. So write a test for it. Uh, so like here, write a test. It's, again, a file with two imports, and at the end, we expect that we have one issue reported, just the one for the Android util log usage. In the case, if you write an Android lint rule, for example, you really want to make sure, because you run on both Kotlin and Java code, you want to make sure that it works in both. So you probably also want to write a test that has Java code to make sure that, oh, no, I'm not actually never importing that in Java code. My rule is just not working there. So make sure it works in both. And these uh, lint rules are a really, really good candidate for test-driven development. Um, if, for example, someone reports a bug on your issue, the first thing you can do is just write uh, a test with the piece of code that is um, being reported as an error. Um, and then you can actually change the lint rule to make that test pass. At the end, if you have your jar with your issue registry and your rules, um, all you need to do is uh, add it as a dependency. Um, with the Linux configuration, that will tell you Gradle to pick up this jar and run uh, and use it as part of the Lint uh, execution. So to recap, you create your issue registry, uh, listing all the issues that you have. Uh, you point to it in your manifest file. Uh, you implement your issues and your detectors, and then you test your rules. Please test your rules. Uh, it's really, really, really helpful, and nothing is worse than having a rule fire over and over and over again, because people will, again, at some point, they will just uh, ignore it. And then tell Lint about your custom rule, um, a custom Lint jar, so that it can pick it up. And also for the other tools, um, the steps are very, very similar. Uh, if you look at the documentation for KT Lint and Detect, um, extending them um, works very, very, uh, in a very similar manner. 
Uh, lint has some more features as well, such as libraries uh, that you write can publish their own lint jars, uh, which then get picked up for consumers. So if you depend on this library, you will aut automatically run the lint rules from that uh, library so that to check that you're using the library correctly, for example. Lint also runs an IntelliJ and gives you the helpful squiggly lines um, while you code, telling you if your code has issues. And you can also write custom quick fixes for it. For example, if for this Android log rule, uh, we could write a quick fix to just alt enter, fix it, and use the correct log rule, uh, log class that you've written. Uh, that is something you can do in your own rules as well. Uh, if you need more information or help or run into issues with Lint, this Google group uh, is there to help you. Um, you can get a lot of support from the team uh, as well in that uh, Google group. So to recap, if you use static analysis tools, uh, and you should, um, they can help make your Kotlin code safer. Um, this example was a very, very simple one with forbidding an import, but rules can go into much, much more detail. As I've mentioned, pointing out security issues in your code, pointing out potential crashes, bugs. So leverage that and, and get the benefits from using them. Also, if you run things like ktlint to format your code, it's going to make your code more coherent. You're going to have a better looking code base at the end, which is easier to read because it's very coherent. Um, and also encode your own best practices. Um, if you need to tweak the tool, add the configuration, add your own rules to encode them. Um, and again, they can help you do, the static analysis tools can help you during a code review, but they won't replace it. Like, always have a human actually review the code. Um, the static analysis tools are not there to replace, it, to replace that, they're there to help you. OK. That's it for me. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions about Lint, Detect, um, or static analysis in general, I'll be around the conference for the next two days. Thank you. <laughs>